100 years. But there's always been little gizmos and chest expanders and cables and Indian clubs and, and such going back to the turn of the, of the uh, 20th century. But uh, again, they, they would evolve through the 20th century as the need came about, but they really took off later, probably about 1970, when, when the machines took a, a big turn. Now, the, during the first, I'd say, 70 years of the 20th century, there was a lot of debate about how do you, most people use free weights still. Dumbbells and barbells were still the dominant tools. And the biggest debates were how to use those, whether you should squat, whether you should uh, squat deeply, whether you should squat at all, whether you should train three days a week, whether you should train one set of exercises or three sets or multiple days. They, they always just argued whether you should pump the muscle or should you cheat and stuff. And those were primarily the arguments for uh, in, in that field all the way up again to 1970. So. Is this about the time when machines versus free weights, the debate on which one is better, begins? In my opinion, yes. Like I said, the, in this industry that's full of pride and egos, there's always going to be arguments about something, about which is better, the my way or your way, right? But again, everybody up to about 1970, they would use the primarily free weights, and they used the, the, the cables and the, and the chinning bars and with, no, with no issue. But in 1970, with the arrival of Arthur Jones, I believe that's when the, the, that argument of which is better, free weights and machines, really took off. Well, who was Arthur Jones, for those who don't know? Arthur Jones was probably the biggest impact player to enter the Iron Game of all time. He was kind of like a modern-day Indiana Jones. And I kind of like say he arrived with his own ideology uh, based on an uh, exercise methodology uh, wrapped with a new exercise equipment technology, and he took the industry by storm. He came about with his own variable resistance machines. And Arthur never really ditched the barbell. He said it was actually a miracle tool c compared to what was pre preceded the barbell. But Arthur took no prisoners, and he didn't come into the industry to make friends. And he basically just ditched everybody. Like, bodybuilders were stupid. They, they were, uh, you know, they, they couldn't understand. They didn't, everybody was trading too much. Uh, and too, too often, too long, and he said it could, it could be done much better. Now, Arthur, he, ha he was a, quite an interesting fellow because his background, he, through the 1940s and 50s, he was already claimed to be very well read before he was in his teens. And he was flying, by the 1940s, he was, uh, he was basically, his war records kept quite quiet. He was, probably had some mercenary activities in May, probably through the late 40s and 50s. And he was flying uh, his own airlines. He was uh, trapping and hunting exotic animals. He was creating movies and films. He made wild cargo based on uh, wildlife, I think, in the early 1960s. But he always had an interest in exercise and working out. And by the mid-1960s, he was leaving Africa, and he was going to be preparing to enter the, uh, the bodybuilding and uh, fitness industry by 1970. And he arrived with his own machine called Variable Resistant Machines that he showcased for the first time in, at the 1970 Mr. American Culver City. So what was he trying to do? Why was he making these exercise machines? What did he feel was, uh, was so wrong with free weights and the barbell that he needed to produce these machines? Like I said, Arthur always liked the barbell, and he, he made very good results using it, but he always said that in the back of the mind there was something wrong. More along the lines that the barbell provided resistance only with gravity was linear, and it was just straight up and down, where he said the body moves axially. Everything with the human body, all our joints move around an axis. And he believed there was a conflict in providing proper resistance to those muscles with gravity or a tool that just moved, had a, like a linear up and down uh, movement for, for resistance. So, he, want, he, for years, he had went through dozens of prototypes, trying to build something that would create like a, a constant resistance, a rotor resistance that would be give, give resistance to the muscles as they move through the joint, and that, that their resistance would vary according to the strength of the muscle or the leverage of the muscle as it moved through that joint system. And that's, Arthur came on the scene. We were starting to learn more, hear things like resistance curve of a machine, the strength curve of a muscle system, foot pounds, torque, 
some things that he took criticism for, like omnidirectional, which really nobody knew what that was. It really was a term. But Arthur came, and he had a good solid physics background, and he would write and explain things uh, like we've never seen before. And w what happened was, it doesn't matter whether you liked him or, or you didn't like him or respected him or uh, whether he was right or wrong, he, everybody listened to him, wanted to hear what he had to say, and everybody was going to try what he was offering because he was, with his, his uh, gift for that, he was also very good at promoting it. And, as some of his own people said, Arthur, Arthur was a, wasn't a con man, but he was a confidence man. He was great at getting your confidence and believing in what he was saying. So everybody who was aware of Arthur was going to try his technology, his training methodologies and his training technology, because he had them both, right? He had a different way of training, more brief, intense, and infrequent, and to use his equipment, that everybody, he felt everybody could use his equipment. Right. So... Nautilus machines, looking back on history now, most people have heard of a Nautilus machine. The business really took off. It made him a multimillionaire. Um, what was Arthur actually claiming about his machines? Well, he just claimed that they were more efficient. And uh, again, Arthur, to show you how successful he was, uh, Arthur's uh, arrival was timed perfectly because the culture was changing. It was becoming more health conscious. And, uh, uh, um, Cooper, uh, Dr. Kenneth Cooper. Kenneth Cooper, thank you. He came up with the book aerobics in 1968, and the running craze was taking off through the 1970s. Again, the, the world was changing. Arthur came in just the right time. The industry was right for someone like him. And with his machines, he, he was claiming they were, they were more efficient and effective in stimulating the muscle. You could do it in one set. And this was appealing to people that they could come in and go through a circuit of machines and just go... 20 minutes or so, 20, 25 minutes, and they're out the door. I, again, this was a, during an era when the bodybuilders and whatever, they're spending three or four hours in the gym a day. Right. And you put that into five days a week, 20 hours, and I said, no, no, three times a week, 20 minutes. Uh, he had this whole protocol all packaged up beautifully. And I, I, again, whether you, you liked him or, or didn't like him or believed him or didn't believe him, it was, it was a brilliant, brilliant promotion that was so effective by the end of the 70s. Uh, the word knowledge was synonymous with just a machine. You could come in, and somebody could come in and see a machine made by somebody else and say, oh, you have a Nautilus. Everybody knew what the word knowledge. Everybody thought every machine was a Nautilus, right? Kind of like jacuzzi yeah. is a hot tub, but jacuzzi yeah. is a brand. Everybody who had heard of Nautilus, the word Nautilus was probably just as big as the name Arnold Schwarzenegger by the, at the end of the 1970s. And that's because of Arthur Jones and uh, the way he, he, was, he was so brazen in what he did that he, he irked a lot of people, but he, he commanded either respect or people who just couldn't stand him, right? But that's just the way he yeah, He was such a, a, uni a unique character. He, he had his own, by the 1980s, he had his own private airport. Well, I think the, the biggest private, longest airstrip in the world. His own zoo. What was it called? Jumble Zoo. Jumble, Jumble Lair. Yeah, the, the, he had, you know, Mickey the gorilla and the elephants and the, the guy, he, he made millions of dollars off this equipment. No, you don't need to be in the gym. You don't need to mimic your sport in the gym. You just need to strengthen your body generally three times a week, 20 minutes, and you're out. You don't have to worry about barbells, okay? So this is really cutting against the grain, and it, this is where the argument started to pick up, which is better free weights or, or, or machines. The bodybuilders were starting to claim, hey, listen, Jones, we were building muscle a long time before you came, and Arthur's had no argument. He says, yeah, but you, you, you could have been a lot more efficient in doing so. So, but then people say, nobody ever won a major title to training on machines alone. So you can see how this thing starts to build, right? 
And especially when uh, the uh, strength coaching came in, which were the most effective. That argument goes on today, you know, which is, uh, which is superior to machines or all this functional training where they don't use machines at all. So, but that began back in the 1970s when uh, the fields of athletics were, were opening up and, and realizing that the doctors, uh, you know, in the medical field that poo pooed uh, weight training for all those years, poo pooed steroids all the years, that they were wrong, that these things did work. Right. And uh, the resistance training was effective, steroids were effective. And they're going to, okay, then from there on, they're going to decide, okay, which is better, they're using barbells and Olympic lifts or using these machines and, and being safer. Arthur said, look, you could just stay on the machines, train safely, and then go practice your sport and let your, whatever strength you build up in the gym, let it naturally infuse itself into your game as you practice, 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 practice. Where a lot of the people, a lot of the athletes uh, go on the other way in the functional training, they're starting to spend a lot more time in the gym and again, through the past few years, we're seeing, in my opinion, more and more injuries start to come into the play. Right. Now, it's been my experience that in this debate of free weights versus exercise machines, most of the people that are taking a very strong stance on one way or the other, they have an invested interest. They, they really aren't uh, just a trainer who, um, who really could have access to both, but a lot of times it's a company who may make barbells or may make machines. Would you say this argument started as a legitimate uh, a legitimate form to see what was the better methodology of training, or do you think it was more business related? Again, in this industry, it's very ego driven. You gotta remember, Arthur, Arthur could have had a better approach to it, but when he came, he came in, he took no prisoners. He, he, he insulted everybody, and people don't like to be insulted. And then they recoil, and then they maybe not give his, his, uh, his equipment or his way its best opportunity. And again, he, he was very effective because the, the way he, he promoted, but it, it was a legitimate argument, how, how one person felt. Like, again, for some people, the, the barbell was just all they needed. They got so much result from it, where other people, they had great results using the machines. And then they think, that, well, that's the only way to train. This is, and the, the other guy thinking, oh, the barbell is the only way to train. And, the brand names and the commercial stuff, that's, that's always been around and it is bigger today probably than ever. And these companies, they, they actually have way too much, I think, control in, in actually the, in sports themselves because of the, the amount of money that they, they put out in, for in promotion and endorsement and stuff like that. So in the 70s, we see Nautilus come to the forefront, literally revolutionize the fitness field. Um, I believe it was in the early to mid 80s, Arthur Jones sells Nautilus. What's the next big boom in exercise machines after that? Was it with his son, Gary? I think so. Arthur, uh, he sold uh, Nautilus in around 1986 and he angered a lot of people in, in that circle. And Arthur went on to create Medex, <clears throat> a line of equipment. Uh, again, he was, Arthur was also pursuing uh, proper strength testing tools and that really occupied his time. He no longer really cared so much about the field of bodybuilding at all, or, but he was more into the medical field. And medics became fair, nothing like the, the popularity of Nautilus. But his son, Gary, uh, who teamed up with Kim Wood, who was strength coaching the Cincinnati Bengals at the time, and also partnered with Pete Brown, whose father, like, the family owned the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, Kim Wood and Pete, they ran Nautilus Midwest, and they made Arthur a lot of money. They were very successful in selling Nautilus through the 1970s and 80s, and they weren't happy at all with the way Arthur sold under the circumstances. And those three men, Gary Jones, Arthur's own son, uh, Pete Brown, and Kim Wood, they broke off, I think, around 1988 and created Hammer Strength. And Hammer Strength, in my opinion, was the Nautilus of the 1990s. They, it was, uh, they were leverage, called leverage machines. They, they were very well constructed and they, you could load plates. So they were almost kind of this hybrid of a machine free weight. So they came in as a kind of a middle ground because you, you still felt like you had lifting almost free weights. You could hear those plates rumbling and uh, hammer strength really took off all through the 1990s and then until they sold out to Life Fitness around 1999. And they're still around. Uh, I, you just don't hear the name quite as much as you did in the 1990s, but uh, they were extremely popular with all the pro sport teams uh, back in, in through that era.
There's no argument. There's because you need them all. They're all they're all just tools, and the more tools you have, the more success you're going to have. Have you had a chance to look at any of the the newer machines? They use computers to vary resistance. They have tilting weight stacks to uh, increase positive and negative load. Um, for those who aren't sure what that means, when you lift a weight, um, if you lifted say 100 pounds, you would lower 140 pounds because you're stronger in the negative. Yeah. Um, have you had a chance to, to use or, or talk to any of the people who make this kind of equipment? No, I'm aware that they're out there. I know what the negative has been emphasized. Arthur Jones emphasized that early on in the 1970s and now there are some machines that will try to enhance that negative aspect, the lowering of the weight for those people who aren't aware of what negative means. The lifting the weight up is positive, letting it come back down is considered the negative. And some people believe that emphasizing the negative uh, is effective and others do not. They think you can actually stress the body and bring in over training. So again, it, there's always arguments, always difference of opinions. But the technology out there today, it, it, you got to admit, it, it's phenomenal. And there are some really well-designed machines that even if anything, forget the arguments, they, they provide variety and some fun. And the, and the way I look at it in terms of training for personal training, it's great to have that variety because you get stale on certain things after a while. It's good to ch change things up. So, and just to, to look, to, to marvel at the, how smart some of the people are to design this equipment as compared to going back before Arthur. Arthur was very uh, impressive in his, what he brought to the, brought to the game. But today, with there's, with there's more money being involved, and there's just some amazing stuff out there. And, and I haven't been on Hardy any, but not compared to at least somebody like yourself. For these exercise machines, they're, they're not going away. They're always going to be in gyms. But at least as the current crop of trainers is coming up, these machines are increasingly expensive. Uh, you know that a good quality exercise machine go anywhere from $3,000 up to $10,000, whereas $10,000 can buy you a pretty decent um, free weight gym. With the cost being so high and obviously the space they take up, what do you think the future of exercise machines are? And they're always going to be there because I said for the variety. Look, it, that, that has merit when you're a single guy and you train on your own. You're not going to spend $100,000 to bid. You have all this equipment training yourself if you can get all the barbells. But if you're training a lot of people, like I said, a cross-section of the population where you have all those anomalies, you're going to spend the money on that equipment because it's going to give you the tools you need, the variety you want, and it's going to give you the business you want, and it's going to pay for itself. And the machines today, the one thing you can always argue, the machines used properly are safer. And there's a reason for uh, the way they've been designed through variable resistance and the, to be used properly through a full range of motion and to, uh, to let the cam do its job. And by eliminating these sticking points, when Arthur made the machine, tried at least the best he could to, make, to vary the load according to the strength of the muscles that move through its system, it would allow the muscle to go deeper into the set, maybe two, three, four reps, because he, he minimized, he, not, totally, not totally eliminate, but minimize the sticking points. And those machines, when used properly, are very effective. Unfortunately, a lot of people get on them and without supervision, and they use them like the free waste. They want to try to get momentum. They want to try to get leverage. They're moving too fast on the machines, and, and, and they're, they're not getting the proper effect. And unfortunately, even some of the trainers don't understand the principles and philosophy around behind the variable resistance machines and why, they, why Arthur made them and the way he did. When Arthur first came into the game, um, he was really looking at bodybuilders. Uh, I know that uh, he trained a couple of uh, uh, Mr. America and uh, Mr. Olympia competitors. And then in his own evolution, he starts moving into the medical field. What, what do you feel is the, the main purpose of these machines as it relates to rehabilitation? Uh, it's uh, how effective can they be in re-strengthening a muscle that's gone under surgery or it's been strained and had to go through a rest period and uh, just uh, for, for strengthening the, the, the muscle. It's, it's, it's been around now for 40 years, people are using this equipment to rehab their, uh, their injuries back into play. And Arthur, he didn't spend hardly any time in bodybuilding. He, with, by 1970, end of 71, he was already pretty much had enough of bodybuilding. I think bodybuilding pretty much had enough of him in terms of his attitude, right? His equipment was going to hang around, but he was moving into the, to the medical field and into the, and it, it, like I said, into conditioning for, for athletics and stuff. But he really wanted the, the medical field. He, he came from his background, his whole family, his father, I think grandfather, there's a number of people in his family who were, were doctors. 
And I, it was almost like Arthur wanted to prove a point to this industry that, yeah, he, he, he has tools, he's making tools that you can use and benefit from. But he was learning the politics of uh, dealing in that field. And Arthur, he, he wasn't afraid to take it on. He was, he was battling politics all through the 1970s and even, even in the equipment industry. But the, the, the medical field, it's, that was his, that became his passion, I, I think, even into medics, obviously. Even the name shows the MedX, right? That's, he wanted to build those, his, his low back machine, his knee machine was all based on proper strength testing and rehabilitation of, uh, of, of, of injuries. And what plagued uh, America was bad backs. Right? right. The last question I'm gonna ask you, Randy, is where do you see this debate going? I mean, it, obviously it's been raging on for years and I don't see it ending anytime soon. Do you see any sort of enlightenment coming upon trainers and in the industry? Or do you think that, again, money's just going to take over? Where do you see this debate heading in the next 10, maybe 20 years? Yeah, that's a good question. I, it's probably just going to keep doing the same thing, as long as money's driving it. It's because it, there's so much money. And you know, if you want to, to get endorsements and, and people, like, especially any sporting organizations, they, they all be based on who's uh, endorsing and, and stuff like that. So it's gonna, always going to be money driven. They're going to be, there's always gimmicks coming out. This is way to train, that way to train. And again, which one is really better? You never know because drugs has totally muddied, muddied the whole picture anyways. Going back 40 years, right? How much steroids were really the driving force between, in, in, in terms of athletic performance. We really don't know how much the, the, the weight's dead because they came along the same time as the, as the drugs. And a lot of people in the field admit that, that they're really properly looking at how effective is weight training or this method versus that method has often been muddied by uh, to the fact that these guys are taking drugs anyways and everybody is going to gain from that, right? But I think the argument is just going to stay the same. This is going to be better than something new is going to come out in order to promote it. You got to ditch the other stuff and say this is better than the people resent that and say no, this is better. And it just it'll probably go around in circles and circles and circles. Machines right. always be there, you know, and, uh, and the gimmicks will always be coming in. I think you're probably right, Randy. I want to thank you again for being on the show today. It was fantastic information. If you want to learn more from the knowledge of Randy Roach, I highly recommend you buy his books, Muscle, Smoke, and Mirrors, Volume 1 and Volume 2.